Alrighty, well we've got a lot of people coming in right now, which is great to see, so I might kick it off. Um, I just want to start off first by acknowledging the traditional owners and the lands on which we're all variously meeting today. I'm on the land of the Duradu Roa people in Wodonga. Um, most of you are probably experiencing quite cold and rainy conditions up here in Wodonga. It's a beautiful sunny day, so I hope everyone's getting a little bit of nature nourishment today. Um, We've got a really, really great talk, talks lined up for you today, and we're celebrating World Environment Day. Um, first up, we've got to Dr. Niall Kawaja, who's going to be talking about the curiosities of cooperative breeding and how we manage migratory shorebirds from his experience working in Broome at the Bird Observatory. And then we'll go to Henry Wooten, who will be talking about the impact of selective breeding, uh, selective fishing, and what this means in a warming climate. So without further ado, I'm going to throw to Niall and we're going to hear a wonderful talk. So thank you, Niall. Great, thanks, Andy. And hi, everyone. Um, so I'm joining you from Bunurong country today. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the Bunurong traditional owners of the land where I live, uh, pay respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And I'd also like to extend that acknowledgement to traditional owners of the country that you might be joining me from today. So my name is Niall Kwaja. I joined the Arthur Ryler Institute in January of this year, and uh, my role at ARI is to lead research on how birds respond to environmental water through the Victorian Murray Floodplain Restoration Project and the Wetland Monitoring and Assessment Programme for Environmental Water in Victoria. And I'm really excited to be here carrying out research with such an important applied focus. Uh, I've been very lucky to study birds in a range of environments in different parts of the world during my career, but I've got to say that Australian floodplains and temporary wetlands are some of the most magical places I've had the pleasure to work and spend time in. So. It's a real privilege to be contributing to research to help environmental management um, at these places. Today I'm going to give a talk that hopefully gives you an idea of my research background. It's titled Ecology and Life History of Social Birds. Well, that's an extremely broad topic. You're not going to come away from this talk knowing everything there is to know about it, and I certainly don't myself, um, but it's a theme that brings some of my research together. So I've decided to focus on recent work that we're hoping to publish soon. And something I hope to convey through these examples is the broad value of detailed research programs and how they can provide insights beyond the initial scope of the studies. I'm going to start in this talk by talking about cooperative breeding, and then I'm going to shift to the coast of Northern Australia to talk about migratory shorebirds. So I'm going to start by talking about these lovely little birds. Um, this is a New Zealand endemic species called the rifleman, and this is the species I worked on during my PhD, which followed on from work started by Steph Preston at the University of Sheffield. Now we're particularly interested in riflemen because they're cooperative breeders. Um, what that means is that sometimes when pairs are raising chicks, they're assisted by additional birds that we call helpers, and these helpers are therefore raising young that are not their own. Cooperative breeding is actually especially common in Australian birds. Um, it's thought to have first been discovered here in the 19th century. And it's quite possibly the most studied form of social behaviour in all birds. It's really fascinated researchers because it's sort of an apparent example of altruism in the national, uh, natural world. So it was in this quite sort of academic context that we were interested in learning how, when and why helping behaviour occurred in this species of riflemen. So this is a page from the Atlas of Bird Distribution in New Zealand, and it shows the distribution of riflemen. Um, hopefully you can see from those red blobs there. Um, what you can see is that they're quite widespread, but they're concentrated in the densely forested areas of both the New Zealand islands, especially around tall primary forest um, in the Southern Alps of the South Island. We studied them sort of at the edge of this range at a site called Kofi Bush near the, the town of Kaikoura. Uh, Kofi bush isn't tall primary forest, it's a sort of serial Carnico and Manuka woodland um, on an alluvial floodplain. And there are two great advantages to studying riflemen here as opposed to other sites. So the first one of those is that the trees aren't that tall, so it was uh, possible to follow individually colour marked birds through the habitat without losing them up in the canopy. And the second thing was that the population here readily uses nest boxes, so this meant that we could follow their breeding attempts in detail. 
So through the course of six breeding seasons, first Steph and then I, Talabanded the birds in this population. We followed um, all their breeding attempts. We mapped out territories. We took blood samples from the birds for genetic analysis, and we recorded who helped who in the population um, to get an idea of the basis of rifleman cooperation. And what we found was that helpers had very high relatedness to the breeds that they helped to raise. Uh, most commonly, they were previous offspring of the breeding pair. And you might be aware of uh, research over recent decades, which has shown that a lot of passerine bird species are often surprisingly promiscuous and make lots of sneaky matings outside the pair bond. Um, but our genetic results showed that riflemen were actually old romantics and stayed faithful to their partners, um, as well as pairing for life. So what this meant was that helpers were usually full genetic siblings of the broods that they were helping with. And helpers also made a real contribution to food delivery um, at nests and broods that helped showed um, increased recruitment compared to those that weren't. Um, this here is uh, just a figure from my PhD thesis, which illustrates that second result. So the picture we got of rifleman cooperation from this research was that it was likely to be favoured because of that genetic monogamy I mentioned. And um, what that meant was that helpers were helping to produce close kin with whom they shared a lot of genes. Um, that meant that the behaviour would be favoured by selection. Um, some ecological factors are also likely to have been important. Um, so one is that rifleman chicks really benefited from food being delivered at a high rate, and that meant that the contributions made by helpers made a real difference. Also, riflemen are quite poor flies and they would only disperse very short distances. They're also only quite weakly territorial. So um, what that meant was that it was easy for helpers to move um, from their own territory back to the territory of their parents um, to help with offspring care. So after doing all this field work, um, I was back in the UK for a few years, writing up my PhD thesis and some papers and doing some uh, university teaching. And I came back to New Zealand in 2018 to start a short postdoc position. And while I was there, I thought I should check out my old field site at Kofi Bush to see how the riflemen were doing. But it was quite disappointing. So uh, when I went there, I found it actually quite difficult to find any birds at the site. Um, there were one or two around, but the population really seemed to have declined to, to a critically low level. And I realized, um, that the level of uh, detailed data that we collected in our study of cooperative breeding might help us understand what had happened um, uh, to, uh, to cause this population collapse. Um, so I went back in to have a look at that data. And there are three key parameters that are broadly going to define a, a population's trajectory, their breeding success, juvenile survival and adult survival between seasons. And that was exactly the sort of data we'd been collecting during our study, so we could calculate good estimates of all three from our data. What we found was that breeding success was actually very high compared to other published estimates from, from other rifleman populations, and that's probably because the nest boxes provided almost complete protection from predators. However, juvenile survival or recruitment was extremely low at 18%, and adult survival was also quite low at 50%. And so we used these estimates to parameterize a very simple population matrix model. We found the model fit the observed decline quite well. So the model trend is shown as the line on this graph. Um, the filled dark circles are uh, population numbers um, from those detailed field seasons uh, where, where we were focusing on riflemen. These later points here that are open, they are um, population sizes estimated by researchers who were there at the site doing general field work on nesting birds, but not specifically focused on riflemen, but you can see they, they fit with that trend as well. And um, we did some sensitivity analysis of this model, and that confirmed that juvenile survival was, was really that most important factor driving down the trajectory of the population. So that was something we could confirm with the data. What we couldn't necessarily confirm, obviously, are the reasons um, for that low juvenile survival. We do have some ideas. Um, so sadly, one observation we made is that it actually corresponded with an attempt at habitat restoration. So it was a time when grazing livestock were being excluded from the site to try and promote understory regrowth. 
And that might actually make conditions more difficult for those juvenile birds, both in terms of foraging and escaping introduced predators. So our results are going to be published later this year in the New Zealand Journal of Ecology. And I think that the results are quite important. Um, these sorts of details are usually sort of quite scant, really, for, for more common widespread species like riflemen. Um, very understandably, it's rare and endangered species that we are usually the subject of this sort of detailed population study. Um, but broadening focus to more widespread species is, is now a big ongoing challenge in conservation. And I think studies of species um, that might have initially had other purposes, like our study of cooperative breeding here, um, these studies might have a part to play in Im improving our understanding of population dynamics in, in more common species. OK, I'm going to give you a blank slide here because I'm making a bit of a, a gear change uh, in this talk from Riflemen, uh, and you might want to shed a few layers because we're going to go up from the South Island of New Zealand um, to the Australian tropics. So this is the beach out in front of the Breeding Bird Observatory, BBO for short, um, on beautiful Yaru country on the shores of Roebuck Bay in northwestern Australia. And I was lucky enough to spend three years here from the start of 2019 until the end of last year, when my partner Jane Taylor and I were wardens of the observatory. Now, the Broome region is home to an amazing diversity of birds. It's one of the best areas for birding in Australia for a lot of different reasons. But to cut that long story short, the primary, well, the reason the observatory is there is because you have scenes like this on your doorstep. The Roebuck Bay is one of the most important sites in the world for migratory shorebirds. And there are more shorebird species in Roebuck Bay in significant numbers than there are at any other site in Australia. Now, shorebirds are social in quite a different way to riflemen. It's not so much in their breeding strategies. It's more outside the breeding season when you get these enormous congregations at important sites like Roebuck Bay and thousands of individuals of many different species are gathered together. The migratory shorebirds are absolutely fascinating animals. I would love to take you through in detail the uh, the life cycle of, of an individual shorebird because it's really fascinating stuff. But I don't quite have time to do that, so I'm going to uh, bring you up to speed with with migratory shorebirds in the form of a few quick facts. So most of the shorebirds that you see in Australia are long distance migrants, not all of them, but most species. And of these migrants, most of them breed in diverse locations across North and Central Asia, including um, areas of Siberia, north of the Arctic Circle. Juvenile shorebirds hatch out of an egg in Arctic Siberia or somewhere else across Asia, and they make their first migration to Australia when they're just a few months old. Uh, that's amazing enough in itself. Um, but what's perhaps even more so is that they find their way here independent of adults. Um, they then, and this is also quite important, they stay in Australia. Um, most juveniles of most species will then stay in Australia for at least a year and a half. Um, so they don't migrate north in their first year of life. And that means that you can see shorebirds, migratory shorebirds in Australia all year round. It's just if you're seeing them um, in our winter, they're those younger birds that haven't started migrating north yet. Shorebird migrations include the longest non-stop flight known by any bird. You might have seen this in the news a couple of years ago. Um, uh, Bartel Godwit um, travelled 12,200 kilometres. It had a tracking device on it and was tracked travelling that far from, from southwest uh, Alaska to New Zealand, uh, thereby breaking a record that was previously held for, for 13 or so years by a different Bartel Godwit going from Alaska to New Zealand. It's an incredible journey those birds make. And um, just to top it all off, they, they're not adapted for gliding or soaring flight, so they flap all the way, which makes it an incredible um, sort of feat of, of energetics. And this is what shorebirds often look like leaving on migration. This is a shot from, from just outside the observatory. Um, you can see the birds in a lovely orderly V formation here. And you can see that they're doing it in a group. So this is also a social behavior, and I can quite happily shoehorn it into this talk. 
And it also sometimes involves different species flying together. You might be able to see the grey plover here among a flock of bar-tailed godwits. Um, and so that potential mixing of, uh, of species in migratory flocks adds another fascinating dimension um, to the behaviour. And shorebird migration is a really active area of research and we've learned heaps about these birds in the last sort of 10 or so years um, thanks to the deployment of, of tracking technologies which have really opened up new avenues of research. Uh, I'm just going to summarise a few uh, really cool recent developments here um, and there are some citations on the slide if you want to follow up any of these um, but just to give a flavour of, of the different things that people are studying with shorebird migration so one is that um, New Zealand bar-tailed godwits are leaving earlier and earlier on migration and that's actually explained by individual birds adjusting their departure times black-tailed godwits can migrate with elevations up to 6,000 meters to take advantage of favorable winds and another great thing about remote tracking is it's revealing really important sites for these species that we simply didn't know about before. But perhaps the most common and um, most sort of sobering headline in research about these species is, is that they're increasingly threatened um, by mudflat loss in the Yellow Sea, which is uh, the most important uh, stopover area for birds on migration um, in this flyway. And so although that amazing population of bar-tailed godwits can go non-stop from Alaska to New Zealand, um, all shorebirds migrating north need to stop somewhere to refuel on the way north and the vast majority need to do so going south as well. And the Yellow Sea is, is the most important area um, where they do that, but it's um, been very threatened by, um, by development and habitat loss in recent years. So, uh, when we were wardens there we had quite a lot of uh, diverse things to do in our role it wasn't all scientific research some of it was hooking car batteries up to generators and finding leaks in the plumbing system and so forth and a lot of it was raising revenue through ecotourism which is what the observatory relies on to fund its existence but we were able to coordinate a research project while we were there on shorebird disturbance i'm going to talk a bit about that so as we've established, many shorebirds are threatened and it's often due to factors outside Australia, um, but disturbance might be an additional concern for them while they're here. Disturbance um, in Roebuck Bay was an issue at high tide. So uh, this photo of a flock taking off here is taken at high tide. At low tide, the water's a lot further away and the birds are spread out across the extensive mudflats of Roebuck Bay feeding. But when the tide comes in, they've got about a four hour period when um, that feeding area is covered up by the tide and they're limited to smaller areas um, along the beaches in the north of the bay near the observatory um, where they basically just get some rest and wait for the tide to go back out. It's called high tide roosting. And there's about 15 kilometres of beaches uh, that run either side of the observatory where birds can do this. Otherwise, the nearest roosting site is about 25 kilometres away at an isolated sand spit that we call Bush Point, which is right on the other end of the bay. So when birds are roosting, they're vulnerable to predators, so they're easily disturbed by threats like birds of prey um, or other things um, like people that they might perceive as a threat. And this causes uh, the birds to take off in alarm flights and that uses up valuable energy for, for shorebirds and uh, as, as they're species that run quite tight energy budgets, that's a bit of a concern. Studies of shorebird disturbance elsewhere in the world have quite inconsistent results. So some researchers think it's really important, others think it's not very important at all. And it seems to depend a lot on the location of the study. There are a few reasons why I might think it would be particularly important in Roebuck Bay. One simply that lots of people um, visit the beaches of the bay, that's both local people and tourists. Another is that there are a lot of birds of prey around. Um, and there's the potential that birds might, uh, that disturbance might cause birds to exceed critical energy thresholds. So I'm now lucky to work with Danny Rogers at ARI. Um, in the 2000s, Danny was doing his PhD research on shorebirds in Roebuck Bay, and he did some modeling which um, estimated that if birds spend more than 15 minutes in flight during the high tide period, they'd actually be using more energy from doing that than it would take them to fly that 25 kilometers to go to the alternative roosting site at Bush Point. And that's a bit of a concern because if it started happening, um, it seems that it would make large areas of the bay unsuitable for shorebirds to use. 
And it also might mean that the observatory loses that amazing wildlife spectacle that currently happens on its doorstep. So we had the opportunity in 2019 and 2020 to replicate a study on disturbance that had been done um, 14 years earlier, um, led by Danny with Chris Hassel and Jan Lewis, using the same methods that they did, um, and that gave us um, a really valuable picture of the issue of disturbance through time. So what we did was we coordinated teams of citizen scientists to watch shorebed flocks in, on beaches in a standardised and repeatable way, and they collected data on the number of alarm flights birds made, the amount of time they spent in flight, and the causes of those alarm flights. And we analysed the combined data sets from those two time periods to give a perspective on disturbance through time. We're currently preparing this to submit to a journal. And just to summarise the findings, we found that disturbance is generally high. This, um, that value of about two and a half flights per hour is higher than we can find in any other published studies. Um, but it was very consistent between the two study periods. There wasn't an increase or a decrease um, from 2005 to the present day. It was significantly higher in the winter. That didn't really surprise us um, because that's when there are more tourists in Broome and also um, more birds of prey around. Um, there are still lots of shorebirds present in the winter, but, but not as many as there are in the summer. So um, it is a slightly better outcome from that perspective. Um, disturbance was higher at some beaches than others. Again, that might not surprise you, but it was really important to identify which beaches um, it was the most concerned on so we could uh, design appropriate management responses. And we did find that birds exceeded that um, critical threshold of 15 minutes in flight at two of the beaches during the winter and were very close to it at a third. So that's um, that was a bit of a concern. And this figure just summarises the causes of alarm flights that we saw. You can see that birds of prey um, sort of dominate, but there are also a substantial um, number of disturbances that are caused by human activity. And that, those are the, the disturbances we can sort of divine, design management to, um, to control. I'm just going to finish by carrying on the theme of kind of bonus discoveries that come from dedicated research. So during the migration period, BVO staff carry out a nightly migration count that's been done in a standardised way for over 20 years, and it's yielded an amazing data set on migration timings of over 15 species. And um, I dream of one day having the time to analyse that data and write it up as a publication. But also simply by being out there doing this monitoring, um, it le has led us to make other discoveries as well. So one in recent years, has been the amazing sight of pied stilts heading north in, in migratory flocks. And that's a species that's usually thought to be an Australian resident. Those records have been accompanied by uh, sightings in Indonesia of birds that were marked in Australia. Um, it was first described in a paper in 2017, led by the wonderful late Clive Minton, but we've had several further records since then of migrating flocks, and we still don't know where all these birds are going. So that's really um, exciting. Another finding was the presence of record numbers um, for the BBO of this uncommon shorebird, the broad-billed sandpiper. Um, we, we had uh, feeding flocks of over 400 birds right in front of us while we were carrying out watches in 2020 and 2021. Um, and regular shorebird counts of the bay, uh, coordinated by Danny Rogers and Chris Hassel for the Australasian Way to Studies Group, have already demonstrated um, that Roebuck Bay has internationally significant numbers of some 20 species, um, but it was nice to add another one to that list. So just to finish and draw this talk together, I hope I've persuaded you that birds uh, share a fascinating diversity of social behaviour, but also that studying this behaviour can improve our, our understanding of nature and of the birds themselves. And it also contributes data that can then be applied to conservation questions. So I've shown how that can be the case with cooperative breeding. And it's also clear that, clearly the case with migration studies as we learn more about where these birds go. And I hope I've also shown the value of just getting out there and collecting detailed data, which can then take you sometimes in unexpected directions. Um, Well-designed monitoring programs provide a wealth of data for addressing all manner of scientific questions. And I'm excited to be taking up some really well-designed monitoring um, as I start in my role at ARI, and also getting started on some more fundamental research on water birds too. And just coming back to social behavior, a final point to leave you with is that there are different types of questions we can ask when we're studying animal behaviour. 
So in behavioural ecology, we talk about how questions and why questions and um, different fields have been studied in different ways. So cooperative breeding is an example of a field that's been dominated by these why questions. Why did helping behaviour evolve? What benefit does it provide? Um, whereas migration studies are more dominated by how questions. How the hell do birds actually do this and how does it develop? Um, and there are recent reviews in both of the, those fields that have start, started to bring the kind of opposite perspective into play. I think it will be a really exciting time for studies of these behaviours as we think more about the evolutionary basis of migration and the mechanistic basis of cooperation. So I'll leave it there. I've got to thank uh, a lot of really important people for um, supporting um, the research I've spoken to you about and um, hopefully we might have time for a couple of questions if anyone has any. Bravo, Niall, that was just fabulous. Oh, what, what a wonderful seminar, like beautiful pictures, great curious questions, really lovely findings. I found that just fascinating. Thank you so much. Um, I kind of feel like I want to blend your questions at the end together and say, why would you want to migrate from Roebuck Bay to the weather that we've got in Melbourne right now? But I know the answer, it's because ARI is amazing, right? So. Welcome, great to have all of that here. Um, big thanks to, A to Andy Geschke for stepping in at the very start today while I was wrangling teams that wasn't really behaving for me well at the start of the seminar. But thanks Andy for starting the seminar today. So Andy, have we got some questions for Niall? What's, um, what's popped up? I saw a couple there earlier. What are we hearing? Oh, maybe my team's is having issues because I can't see any questions ah, at all. So I'm well, going to have to pull one out of my Let pocket tonight. Let me just wait while it goes around again. I know yeah. there was one about dogs. So let me just jump in for one sec. So Niall, this is about disturbance of shorebirds, right? Mm -hmm. um, for the disturbance research, what are the recommendations around management activities? Like, should dogs be banned from beaches? Um, should people be banned? maybe during winter when the birds are more skittish. Your thoughts? Yeah, it's a, that's a really good question. And it's um, uh, it's all very sort of dependent on the local context. Um, so we had a number of, of recommendations. Um, these, these beaches are very sort of, uh, or a couple of them are, are really well um, established as recreation areas for the local community. Um, so we didn't want to be sort of too confrontational in, um, in banning people from beaches, um, but uh, there's certainly a lot of work to be done on education, um, uh, particularly around uh, sensible use of, uh, of dogs as well. We did recommend uh, banning drones, which are really something that, that birds are quite heavily disturbed by, um, and that's something which is, which is kind of happening now. Um, but yeah, it was. It, it's quite sort of case by case for the different beaches. Um, one thing that we're we're kind of hoping to get a trial of is something called a floating roost just offshore at one of the sites, which will give the shorebirds somewhere alternative um, to use as a roost, while not preventing people from still being able to to um, you know enjoy one of those beaches in the town of Broome, which um, which which is heavily used um, at the time. Um, a couple of other beaches that are closer to the observatory aren't actually visited so much by people and our recommendations are, are more along the lines of um, encouraging uh, sensible use by uh, people who might be fishing there um, so they're not leaving fish scraps on the beach and attracting birds of prey. Um, so yeah there, there are certainly and there are certainly areas like in Victoria where shorebirds are actually breeding um, where uh, banning dogs and uh, off leads and all that sort of thing it is is a management action that that certainly would be recommended um, but it is all very context specific in terms of uh, in terms of what uh, recommendations should be at particular sites I think yeah yeah we certainly have some of those restrictions on some of our beaches already and I um I, uh, I am disturbed by drones. So yeah, let's go with banning drones in all kinds of places. That'd be great. <laughs> um, have we got time for one more, Andy? I reckon we do. Quick answer maybe. The one about, yep. um, there's, a, there's a question Niall about the issue around stock in New Zealand. So it's saying, um, why do you think the removal of stock in New Zealand might be linked to a reduction in the fledgling success? Yeah, again, this was quite a, a 
was something we weren't necessarily expecting and it was and I think it's quite a sort of site and species specific thing um, but it was particularly at that site as the understory was growing back um, my colleague made a few observations that um, that the juveniles were struggling to um, have open space where they could forage and actually getting stuck in the vegetation a little bit um, and there are uh, there are published papers elsewhere that have shown that as um, understory growth increases actually you get higher densities of some of those invasive mammal predators um, like black rats and, and so on. So possibly it's something that um, for in future management might need to be combined with um, predator trapping or something like this. Um, yeah, I think obviously uh, forest regrowth is, is something that we really do want to promote. Um, but uh, again, yeah, quite a sort of species specific case where it, it didn't um, or the conditions didn't seem to, to improve things, at least in that intermediate stage um, for the species we were studying. Yeah, really interesting findings. Thanks so much, Niall. Um, Andy, you think we, we should progress? Yep, let's let's head over to Henry. Let's head off to Henry. So um, now absolutely delighted to also welcome Henry to deliver our seminar today. I'm, I'm just delighted with the both the seminars we have today. It's so exciting and Niall's taking us through a whole lot of questions around or well, population questions around birds. Now we're going to hear some similar population type questions around fish and, and joining different issues together. Really intrigued with this. Thanks so much, Henry, over to you. Thanks, Fern, and thanks uh, everyone for listening to the seminar today. My name is Henry Wooten and I've recently joined ARI in the population processes team. Now I'm gonna present on some of the research, some of my research background. And that is some work I did as part of my recently completed PhD. And my talk is titled, Can Fish Populations Populations respond to fishing, warming temperature, and altered hydrology. Now, this work really has a marine focus, but the same principles apply to freshwater aquatic systems. So, what is fishing? When we think of fishing, I think quite often we think of images like this. And this is my partner and my dad helping to collect um, some data during my PhD. This is what we generally call angling. Um, and uh, it's true that uh, science always really is collaborative. But we also fish commercially um, and I chose this image just because it gives an, uh, an idea of the sort of scale uh, which um, this process occurs at. So this is just a trawler with a you know a large trawler with a large uh, net and a large fishing uh, fishing catch and um, this sort of this commercial fishing can actually impose up to 80 percent more more mortality than um, than natural mortality would normally impose alone. So when we commercially fish we drag a net across the, the bottom of the ocean and it looks looks like this. this is a trawl net and so fish are, fish are caught in this net and, and small fish can generally get through the mesh size and it captures the larger sizes of fish. And what this means is that fishing is size selective. So here we have an example of a cod trawl fishery and um, this is just demonstrated with this graph where we have a retention probability of the fishing net on the y-axis plotted against length so that's size. And we see as, as okay. fish get larger, their retention probability by the fishing gear increases. So what this means is we generally capture the larger individuals of a population when we fish using these um, techniques. And what this means is that fishing truncates stocks. And when I, when I, when I say stock, I, it's just a fishery term for a population. So what this, so what this means is that um, fishing really uh, removes the larger individuals. And as it's just shown an example here, in the uh, Atlantic cod fishery, so that's um, in, over in Europe. And we see the average size of fish in 1901 plot, uh, plotted against the average size of fish in 2005. So we're really, th these population on average are really shrinking. What this means is that you get declines in the reproductive capacity of populations. We see up to 80% decline in the breeding stock and older, older individuals are also thought to be more successful breeders. Conversely, we also see um, increases in growth in these populations because there's less individuals and we get decreases in competition. So we're having large impacts on, on fish populations when we fish them. Now, I showed you an, uh, an example of a trawl fishery before, but we don't always fish in that, in that way. There's also other fishing gears that we use. This is a picture of a uh, gill net. This is quite often strung across the entrance of um, estuaries or in rivers. And what this fishing sort of type does is 
uh, is uh, targets the mid range of sizes. So larger fish actually bounce off the net and they're not captured and small fish can swim through the net. So this imposes a different sort of mortality on population. So this um, uh, impacts the mid range of sizes. Now, we think the size selectivity that fishing imposes on populations also drives more long term evolutionary responses. And what we're seeing is ob observing shifts to faster life histories. Here, selection on size can combine with a generally high mortality of fisheries to infer a fitness benefit to faster juvenile growth, earlier maturity, small adult size, and increased relative reproductive investment. This is demonstrated here in the graph where we see size on the y axis plotted against age. And the line here just shows some average growth curve of, of a fish population. So we have fast juvenile growth, maturity with the green bar, and then slower adult growth when they reach sort of larger sizes. What we're observing is this, this darker, this, this solid line here where we see faster juvenile growth, early maturity, and smaller adult size. Now these shifts can infer an evolutionary advantage, as for example, individuals can mature and reproduce uh, faster before coming in contact with fishing gears, so before they're caught. Um, uh, this is really important because life history traits, the, the sort of changes in, in, in the traits that, we, that we're talking about here, are key determinants of individual and population demography. So this is likely to, it's likely that we're fundamentally changing the sort of biology and, and ecology of, of the species that we're fishing, and it's going to have large impacts for the species that we fish, but also more broadly across systems. It's said that fishing can select against adaptation to natural environments, and evolutionary responses could mean slow recovery if fishing is relaxed. And typically, we're actually noticing around um, rates of trait change are around around one percent per year, and that's you know if you think about that over a decade time period, that's we're having large impacts in sort of the on the biology of the species. I talked about introduced fishing as a as a stressor before. But we're also noticing that aquatic systems are rapidly warming. And here's just an example of a, of a coral reef, which is um, uh, on the left and, and one which is the same one, which is bleached on the right due to increased temperature. And this means that we're really not fishing in stable environments. Now, higher temperatures directly impact on fish through modification of growth rates, increased physiological rates and increased rates of natural mortality. This is all resulting in almost ubiquitous shifts to fast early growth, early maturity, and smaller adult size, i.e. faster life histories. And you notice I put the same graph as, as I showed you before with responses to fishing, because we're noticing the same changes. Um, I'll just show you some evidence of these, of these shifts to, to smaller size. Here on the y-axis, we have size, av average size, plotted against time for a haddock fishery, which is another European species. And we see that the average size of these populations are declining, uh, declining through time. Now, temperature also impacts differently on differing life stages. We think that the early and, light and, and later stages of life are actually more sensitive to warming. Uh, it's just shown with this little diagram here where we have the sequence of life stages plotted against aerobic thermal window. And you can think of that as just the, the range that, of temperatures that um, you know, life history processes can occur at. We see it's much narrower for eggs and larvae and spawners than than adult than adult stages. So they're more susceptible as young and 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 um and breeding uh, breeding fish. This really means that we can't just focus on adult fish, which is what we tend to do. So I introduce fishing and warming as differing differing stresses on fish populations. And we're certainly studying 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 these processes, but we really study them in isolation. And then they don't occur in isolation, they really occur. Uh, at the same time on fish populations. We really need to study them together to understand if they might be interacting to you know, differentially impact on, on fish populations. This is just an example to show that of, of uh, Ge the Geelong star, which is a super trawler and an extension of the East Australian current down the east coast of Australia, bringing warm water um, down to Tasmania and bringing, um, bringing larvae with it too, I think. So what are our solutions to this? Well, one thing we can do is um, use multi-generational selection experiments, and that allows us to understand the mechanisms of responses to these stresses. What we can then do is apply understanding to wild populations uh, and try to help with that management. 
So as part of my PhD, I ran a multi-generational selection experiment on zebrafish, which is a tropical freshwater species. Um, and we sourced 2000 wild type individuals as the original population. So I'll just take you through the experiment, experimental design. We had three selection treatments or fishing treatments, a control treatment, a trawl fishing treatment and a gill net fishing treatment. We combine this with two temperatures, a 26 degree control, which is the normal temperature for this species, and a 30 degree um, warmed simulation. We had three replicates of each of these combinations, which meant that we had 18 populations in total and 250 individuals per population. That's just shown here. We had, here's a, an example of a, of a warm tank with control, trawl fishing and, and gillnet fishing. And we separated these populations with, um, with dividers and had them at the same at the warm temperature and then also at the cooler temperature. Now we house these populations over about eight or nine generations. And that's just shown here with the timeline below. Um, and each of these little blocks is a different generation. And I'll take you through what they what they actually mean, what these codes mean. PG, the first two PG generations mean parental generations, and that's just to allow the populations to get used to the experimental conditions. And then the five F generations here are where we actually applied the, the different treatments, so the warming and the fishing. And then the two CG generations here, that, that term means uh, is, is short for common garden generation. And what you do there is you relax the selection. So you bring everything back to the control level and you still track the responses. And if you're still sort of noticing some differences between the control and the uh, selected populations, it gives you an idea of whether you have imposed some evolutionary change there. So it really allows you to tease out the difference differences in in responses to selection um, in your earlier treatment generations. So that's just shown here again, and we'll just zoom in on this F2 generation. And I'm just showing you this to show you that in each of these generations, we really um, house these populations right through their life history. So we so we we house them as eggs, and then as juveniles, and then later on as adults. And then those adults were used to then spawn the the following generation. So they were linked across generations there. Here we have um, uh, just how we house the population. So we have the juvenile tanks on the left and the and the adult tanks on the right, and just me there. And you can see the, the large larger fish there on the on the right panel. And housing these uh, these populations also involved culturing a whole bunch of gross um, pond microorganisms. So that was to feed the fry because they had to eat, they had to eat um, live food. So you can see here's there's some. Pond cultures extracted from a pond and then feeding them across. And I'll take you through the, the two different fishing selections that we that we imposed. So we had a sigmoidal fishing selection treatment, and that was designed to mimic this trawl fishery that I was talking about before. And here we see selection intensity plotted against size in the population. And, and again, as we see size increases, you get higher selection intensity. So we're removing those larger individuals and allowing the small individuals to breed the next generation. We also had this Gaussian fishing selection, which was designed to mimic a, a, this um, this gill net fishery. And here we have a dome shaped selection function. So that's targeting the mid range and allowing the, the smaller and the larger individuals to uh, reproduce. Now, across all the generations, we measured a whole range of responses. They were juvenile responses, adult responses. We measured uh, metabolism, reproductive investment, maturity, all this stuff. but. I'm today I'm going to focus on the early life history responses, and that was egg size, development rate, and early survival. And what all these processes um, coalesce in, which which is the recruitment rate. Now that is um, that's just, that essentially describes uh, a population replenishing itself. So it's a, a population's ability to provide juveniles that then become adults, um, and that process is really uh, crucial because if that process isn't functioning, then you're not going to have a sustaining population, and you really can't fish it. So what did we find? Uh, we found that recruit, recruitment really collapsed under warming. Now I'll take you through this graph step by step because it's somewhat complex. But here on the y-axis we have recruitment proportion, and that essentially describes the ability of, of our populations to provide 250 adults into the next generation. I remember 250 was our population size that I showed before. And this is plotted against generation um, here. So we have the F generations and the common garden generations. And the line, the blue line here shows the control populations through those generations. And we, we found that they had complete recruitment through time. So that was that was good to see. Now, when I introduced the warm populations, we saw 
high recruitment for the first few generations, but then a, a decline in the fourth generation to about 65% or, or 0.65. And then in the fifth generation, that then declined again to about 50%. This was a super strong result and actually really surprised us. Um, I think it has sort of large implications for the future su sustainability of fish populations under warming. Now, interestingly, when we uh, then uh, reduced selection, so we took it back to control in the common garden generations, uh, we saw immediate recovery. And it suggests that the impacts that we saw in those um, early generations weren't evolutionary, and there was some plastic or direct impact of temperature on, on, um, on these populations, which was driving the recruitment decline. So if we take the results I just presented and, and focus on this, the results in this in this inset box and split those results into their prospective fishing treatments. So I'll just, just show you what I mean by this. So in the F4 generation, we have we split it into control with the X, Gaussian selection, fishing selection with the triangle, and sigmoidal selection with the with the square there. We found there was no difference between the fishing selection in that F4 generation. In the F5 generation, the sigmoidally fish, so the trawl fishing simulation, those populations had lower recruitment than the other um, fishing treatments. And one population uh, of the sigmoidal fish populations even went extinct in the in the in the experiment. So um, that's an example of the inter interaction I was getting at before. So it shows that you know if we're fishing uh, sigmoidally, uh, you know, in the wild. Potentially, that's um, going to have large implications uh, when it interacts with warming uh, in the future. So we're also really interested in what drove these recruitment declines. Um, I won't show the data today, but I'll just talk to you quickly about what we think happened there. We think that the, the general decline we saw in the warm treatments can be explained by shifts to faster egg development rates, um, and that this came at, the, at a cost to recruitment um, rates. To explain the result in the warm sigmoidal populations, I found that sigmoidal fishing affected the sex ratio of those populations, where fishing preferentially removed like the generally larger females. So if we're removing the larger individuals um, and larger individuals are generally female, then uh, we're, we're actually going to get a male bias population. And we think that, that that sort of male bias meant that these populations weren't able to produce enough eggs and that um, uh, contributed to the, to the recruitment decline. So just some key messages to take from this. Um, we found really large impacts of warming on, the, on recruitment of fish. These impacts took multiple generations to manifest and it really highlights the value of multi-generational multi selection experiments. Now, generally we study these impacts of warming you know, in short-term experiments, maybe one or two generations, but we took that further with this experiment and found you know, really strong results then. So I think we need to sort of look more long-term in terms of our um, experimental design in the future. We also found that preserving body size diversity could help to buffer against the impacts of warming, and that was really that was a really uh, optimistic result because it shows that you know we can slightly modify um, our fishing practices potentially, and that might help populations persist into the future. So that was really cool. Uh, additionally, a fast recovery indicates that we saw indicates that the effects were not evolutionary and that these populations should show good responses to, to management if we, um, if we go down that route. So as I mentioned before, um, I've recently taken a position at, uh, at the Arthur Ryle Institute in the population processes team. Essentially what we do is we use a technique called population modeling to assess population responses to broad ranges of management interventions. Now I think that what this thing we call population modeling also always sounds really intimidating. But essentially what it is, is it's all of our knowledge of a species represented as a bunch of equations in a computer. You can see that here. What we do is we put this model in the computer and press go and extract out some statistic that we want at the other end. And this is often abundance estimates, for example, so we can compare responses to some sort of management action. So we see that here, abundance plotted through time, and we see comparisons of you know populations um, under no intervention and then some, some intervention. That might be more water down a river system, for example. Now, the, the strength of this technique is really that it's predictive and it allows us to, to assess management actions before they're implemented and also at a really large scale. So we can ask these questions at a basin scale, 
and maybe even a continental scale. Um, this is sort of uh, this potentially is a larger scale than we can sort of go and do experiments out just because costs are so prohibitive um, there. So I'm really excited to be working in this team because it gives me a chance to try and study what I learned during my PhD in wild populations. So that's that second step I was talking about before, trying to apply that that sort of um, that knowledge that we gain and uh, into wild into management of wild populations. I'll be really interested to try to build in future responses to warming into our models um, to try and you know improve our predictive capacity um, in a warming world. Thank you, everyone. I think hopefully we've got time for questions. I think we do. We do have time for a couple of questions. We do. Thank you so much, Henry. That was um, that was fabulous. Thank you so much. Uh, terrific talk. Thanks so much, Henry. Uh, I feel a lot of different things after watching that talk. I found it exciting and fascinating, slightly terrifying. But I'm also a bit optimistic by some of the things you shared. And like Niall's talk, you really demonstrated how important it is for us to have good data, whether it's detailed data, long term data, rich data that we can really answer these questions properly and not get a skewed view by a narrow window. So thank you very much. It was really terrific. We do have some questions. I think Andy's going to take us through a couple. Thank you, Andy. No worries at all. And thank you for the audience sending through such good questions. Hopefully we'll get through a couple. Um, Sarah's asking around this uh, terrifying aspect, is a 30 degrees temperature realistic under warming and under climate change? And what kind of predictions can we make under different climate change temperature scenarios for fish recruitment? Yeah, great question. Thanks for that. I think um, we chose the 30 degrees as, as uh, um, some sort of temperature difference where we think that we were going to uh, estimate or, or, or measure some sort of you know effects of, of warming. So that's not necessarily you know a, a strictly um, uh, representative of, of, of you know how, how the climate is warming and really sort of getting some uh, a general a general trend upwards rather than sort of a, a step like like we imposed. Um, so yeah, the design there was really to try to sort of get something that was um, you know within within some sort of uh, reasonable range but then also measure some um, some sort of response so that's a great question it's sort of it's sort of a tricky one that we, we had to sort of uh, really um, discuss um, carefully to sort of land in some sort of range where um, uh, we thought we were going to get some 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 valid results and it's sort of it's an experimental design aspect there that it's sort of really difficult to sort of really accurately represent that sort of that climactic trend upwards. So great question. Thanks. Good stuff. Thanks for that one. Um, we've got a question around the different fishing methods you looked at, which is the trawler and the gill net. Um, someone's asking yep. about whether or not we've investigated or looked at indigenous fishing methods and what those selective pressures might look like. Have you got any experience on that? No, I think that this this um, uh, this project was sort of focused on that sort of commercial fishing. So we were sort of looking at those, you know, industrial scale uh, modern fishing techniques that you know we employ off the east coast of Australia. That I think traditionally we have also fished like the freshwater um, systems in Australia. That's sort of reduced reduced back now, I think, because we saw population declines. But I think that's a that's that'd be um, that'd be a great, really interesting question to sort of maybe maybe uh apply that sort of more traditional fishing technique and um into a sort of similar comparative uh, experiment and we could potentially sort of i'd say much more likely to see more sustainable outcomes there so sort of lower 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 mortality rates potentially different different selectivities maybe maybe we didn't sort of see such targeting of larger individuals and there was more of a spread across the the size range there but yeah i think a really interesting question for the future Thank you. Um, you mentioned that in your your research that the sex ratios were being skewed due to selective pressure. Is that something we're seeing in the wild with other with commercial fisheries? Yeah, thanks, Andy. The uh, that sort of sexual size dimorphism that we saw in in uh, in zebra fish in the experiment is really common in the wild as well. So um, you see the species on the on the screen here. This is Atlantic cod. 
Um, you certainly see that the same thing. So if we're targeting the larger individuals, I think it's likely that we'll, we'll be sort of skewing the sex ratio there as well. Um, plenty of Australian species have the same the same sort of sexual si size dimorphism as well. Murray cod have have that. I believe golden perch have that as well. So um, I think that if, you know if we are if we are employing that sort of that trawl fishery selection, so removing those large individuals, it can be really common that we're going to have uh, more males, especially in the in the older ages. So I think that's um, yeah likely to be sort of an issue across uh, a lot of species that we're that we're targeting. Yeah. Thank you. Um, final question um, before I throw back to Fern. Uh, this relates to, I guess, the, the applicability of your work seems like it's got a lot of applications in the real world for, for management. Um, do you have relationships with management bodies or anything to use this or have you had much interest in, in applying this research into the practical commercial fisheries? Yeah, thanks. That's a great question as well. The I was sort of saying before, the, the real reason or the real sort of underlying approach here is to try and understand the, the mechanisms um, uh, underlying responses to fishing and warming. So that's that's why we use this this uh, this model organism of zebrafish. That's not really, there's going to be sort of differences between zebrafish's responses to potentially, um, you know, fish populations in the wild. Uh, so I think um, I think that the the ideal approach there is to sort of uh, understand the mechanisms and, and, and really uh, uncover some some really good questions that you then go and ask in the wild as well, just to make sure that you're getting the same response um, and, and that those those are valid. Because all fish populations are going to be have, operating slightly differently. I think is is the underlying um, answer there. So we've had um, during my PhD, I worked a little bit with some some Australian um, fishing uh, fishing organisations, but uh, I think really that these questions really need to be then asked before they're applied in 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 in, the, in wild populations. But yes, I think that generally we sort of it, what what the what our results are showing is that we really need to be sort of worrying about the future of of um, uh, sustainability uh, in fish populations. Yeah. Thank you, Henry. Um, really appreciate it. Great talk, and um, thank you for taking the time. Then I'm going to throw it back to you. Yeah. Thank you, Andy. Thanks so much, Henry. Thanks so much, Niall. Thanks, Andy, for all the tech in the background, especially with my little Teams glitch at the start for handling all the questions. Thanks to everybody who provided questions and everybody for coming along today. Really interesting pair of seminars. Hope you'll join us again next month. Next month, we will be celebrating NADOC week. Our seminar will be on July the 4th. We'll have a panel hosted by Maddie Miller one of our postdoc researchers at ARI that we supervise in collaboration with the University of Melbourne. Still finalising the other speakers there. We're nearly there, but look out for the emails from Andy and we look forward to you joining in with our next seminar. I'm Fern Hames. It's been really terrific to join you today for the seminars. Thanks to everyone. Have a great um, week that's following on from World Environment Day. Thanks very much. Bye.